that as well. Psalm 100, normally you think about that as far as preachers preaching out of it around Thanksgiving, and I've done that several times, but I uh, was uh, looking at Psalm 100 <coughs> a few weeks back, and uh, there's a, a verse and actually a phrase in, in a verse that sort of stood out to me, and I got to thinking about it and studying a little bit on it, so that's what we're going to share with you tonight. Lord willing. Verse 1, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him. And bless his name, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Dear Lord, we're grateful for this opportunity that you've given us to meet together uh, once again uh, this evening. And uh, we are thankful for the salvation that you have so uh, freely given us in Christ. And I pray that you'd help us all to uh, not only be grateful for what you've done for us in saving us, but I pray that uh, we would be challenged by your word uh, tonight to uh, serve you as we should. I pray that you'd help us uh, to honor and glorify and magnify the Lord Jesus in all that we do every day of our lives And may we be found faithful uh, servants uh, in the cause and the work uh, of Christ. We pray that you'd bless our time in your word, give wisdom and direction, and I pray that uh, you'd help me. I certainly need you and uh, not sufficient uh, of myself. So, Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God would use his word to stir and challenge our hearts tonight according to your will for each one of us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I want you to look at verse 2 again in uh, Psalm 100. And this uh, first part of the verse is what I want us to think about. Just simply this, serve the Lord with gladness. And you know, serving the Lord is a good thing. And that ought... that. Biblically, that should follow our salvation. And uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10 tell us uh, that we're not saved by our works, uh, but we are saved to work and to serve. Verse 10 in, in particular says, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus and two good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So it is a Bible truth that uh, as believers, we should serve the Lord. We should serve with gladness, he says. And I, I, I was thinking about that, and there, there are people obviously that serve. I was thinking about the uh, list for the sign up for master clubs out there, and I see that couple of times a week, and uh, this church has always uh, been characterized by people who are willing to serve, and you're certainly to be commended for that. And uh, again, that's uh, God's will for every Christian uh, to be servant, uh, to, to, to be a servant. But uh, sometimes we can serve And the gladness may not be there. He says, serve the Lord with gladness. And you look at Psalm 100, and there are several things that we're told to do. Uh, For example, uh, look in verse 1. He says, make a noise. Uh, We can be good at that sometimes, can't we? Make a noise. He says, look at verse 2 again, serve. And then also he says, come before His presence. 
In uh, verse 3, look at what he tells us to do. No, we're to know something. No. And verse 4, he says that we're to enter and we're to be thankful and we're to bless. And all of those things are good for us to do. But have you noticed, I left part of those verses out. Uh, there, there's a way that we're supposed to do those things. And God is concerned not only but, uh, with, with what we do, but how we do that. So it's important for us to serve, but it's also important for us to uh, serve in a right way. Again, uh, in verse 1 he says uh, we're to make a noise, but we're to make a joyful noise. There's a difference in that too, isn't there? Uh, We're to serve Him with gladness in verse 2. We're to come before Him, but we're to come before Him with singing. We're to know Him, but we're to know Him And uh, I just uh, noted this, we're to know Him biblically. That's the only way we can know Him. What we know about God, who He is, His person and His nature and everything, we learn from the Bible. And knowing Him biblically would uh, uh, help us understand that He is our Creator. He says there, It is He that hath made us and not we ourselves. We're to know Him lovingly. He says we are His people. Reminds us of our family relationship with the Lord. We are His children. He's our Heavenly Father. We're to know Him dependently. He also says there we're the sheep of His pastor. And so it's not just knowing Him but knowing Him biblically. And then we're to enter into His gates. We're to enter with thanksgiving. We're to enter into His courts with praise. And so all of these things we're admonished to do in this psalm, and we're also told how we are to do them. And this action that uh, God expects from us uh, with joy with gladness, with thankfulness, with praise and so forth, that is all centered in the Lord Himself. Look, if you would, again at verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Verse 5. For the Lord is good... His mercy is everlasting and His truth endureth to all generations. And so when you think about serving Him and serving Him with gladness as well as these other things that we're admonished to do and how we're to do them, uh, the, the foundation of being able to do that in the way that God would have us to do that is knowing Him and knowing Uh, what He's like. In Psalm 46 and verse 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 95 verse 3, For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Verse 6 in Psalm 95, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Verse 7, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Verse 3 also reminds us that that God is unique. There's no one like him. Uh, He is God alone. He's not one of many. Uh, He is the Lord. He says there, know ye that the Lord, He is God. And having a right and biblical understanding of Him uh, will uh, motivate us and strengthen us and empower us 
not only to serve Him, but to serve Him with gladness. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 35 says, Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, He is God, there is none else beside Him. Deuteronomy 4.39, Know therefore this day and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, He is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 9, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God. And I like what he says next, The faithful God. That's encouraging to know. Uh, that can't be said of me. Now, I'd like to be faithful, but the fact is uh, all of us, we fail in our faithfulness sometime, but there's never been a moment in all of eternity that God has been unfaithful. And He's identified in Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 as the faithful God. That can't be said of anybody else. You remember what David <coughs> declared uh, when he went out to face Goliath? And uh, that, that, that in itself, the fact that David, the shepherd, uh, was willing to go out and face this giant, uh, that's a challenge and, and uh, it's amazing in itself. But when he was... Uh, about to go out, this is what he said in 1 Samuel chapter 46, or chapter 17 and verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. Now he's saying, uh, 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 speaking this to Goliath, that giant. And he says, I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. That's almost amusing to think about that, isn't it? Uh, here is, they say, most uh, things that I've read and, and tried to figure out and study about Goliath is over nine feet tall. And here is David just a lad, a lad and he says, I'm going to take your head off. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take thine head from thee. And not only that, he goes on and says, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines. Goliath, not only am I going to deal with you, I'm going to take care of the rest of them as well. The host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. And here's why. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Now after, after saying all that he did, David knew and David acknowledged that it was really going to be God who did this. And, and it was God himself that delivered Goliath and the rest of the Philistines into the hand of the Israelites that day. And David's desire, David's motivation in all of that is expressed in that uh, a statement that he makes that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And so if we're going to be able to serve the Lord with gladness, we better make sure that we do know God and know what He is like from the Bible. And of course the only way that anybody can know Him is through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. John 17 and verse 3 says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. 1 John 5 and verse 20, And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. And so obviously we have to know Him in salvation. And that is through Christ. Most of us in here tonight would 
give testimony that uh, uh, there's been a time in our lives when uh, we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our uh, personal Savior. And that's something to rejoice about. But after that salvation, once we know Him in salvation, there should be in our hearts an abiding desire to increasingly know Him in sanctification. Becoming more like Him. And obviously that would include serving Him with gladness. Paul gave this testimony in Philippians 3 and verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. He's talking there about knowing the Lord Jesus Christ in a a greater way than uh, just in salvation. And I'm not minimizing the importance of knowing Him as Savior. But uh, growing in that love, maturing in that love, making making progress, uh, loving Him and knowing Him more and more and more the longer we're saved. We're also reminded (coughs) of the need of this lost world to know Him. In Acts 17 and verse 23, Paul there at Athens And he said this, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. And Paul said this, Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, Him declare I unto you. And that need of this world has not changed since that day. Uh, That need is still there. For this world... Uh, to know the God that is revealed in the Bible, revealed in His Word. And God uses His people uh, to make Him known. And so verse 3 also reminds us that He is our Creator. And I think all of these things, you you can look at them individually and you can look at them collectively as they're all mentioned in this psalm. But all of these things are uh, encouragements and serve to motivate us to serve the Lord with gladness. It says, Know ye that the Lord, He is God, it is He that hath made us and not we ourselves. That's one of the major problems in the world in which we live today is man's refusal to acknowledge that. If if I know that He is my Creator and that my life uh, is dependent upon Him, that that's, that's going to affect my attitude toward Him and my desire to serve Him as I should. Psalm 95 and verse 6 says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And He being our Maker, our Creator, should result in our worshiping Him and our submitting ourselves to Him. Psalm 139 <coughs> verse 14 I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's what God did, fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Psalm 119, verse 73, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. I thought his Interesting and also challenging in that verse that uh, the fact that he acknowledges that God has made him. Thou, thy hands have made me and fashioned me. And what effect did that have on the psalmist? He said, Lord, give me understanding uh, that I may learn thy commandments. And I think it be clear Behind that desire is that desire to know God in a greater way. 
And as our creator, God has made no mistakes, has he? And I think that's relevant in this matter of serving and serving with gladness because you cannot serve uh, at, at, like anyone else. Sometimes we spend our lives wishing we were somebody else. Uh, I know I've, uh, I've had thoughts as a preacher. Boy, I wish I could preach like that. I, w- I wish I could be like him. Well, if I really think about that, and, and that, that is really my desire, then in some way, at least to some degree, I'm expressing a dissatisfaction with how God made me. And uh, I'm envious that he didn't make me like somebody else and uh, have me do what somebody else is doing. No, he, he has no, made, made absolutely no mistakes in any of us. And God has a, a will for each one of us in this matter of service. And knowing, finding God's will for my life is key in being able to serve Him gladly. And uh, apart from that, now sin has, has marred and corrupted us. And of course we have to deal with that in our lives. But as God has made us, His hands have made me, he says, and fashioned me. God, uh, God made you just like he desired for you to be, and God has a will uh, specific for you. And uh, if you're going to serve him gladly, then the thing we must do is, is find what God would have for us to do and then do that with joy. And gladness. I mentioned earlier that there, <clears throat> there are those who serve. Matter of fact, there are Christians who know they should serve, but don't. That's, that's a whole other problem, isn't it? And then there are those who do serve, but they don't do it with gladness. Doesn't it just make sense if we expect to make an impact on this world and the community in which we live, if, if they see us, they observe us and, and watch us, and we are constantly complaining or, or uh, griping, and, and we're bitter, we, we act like that uh, we're, we're on our way to the funeral home, especially... You know, that would be true when we come to church. We're gathered together and, and uh, we're, that, that, there's, that's supposed to be a joyful time, isn't it? Come before His presence, He says, with singing. Well, what, what kind of singing? Well, it's to be with joy and gladness. And uh, that coupled with our serving with gladness, God can use and I believe does use to impact the lives of other folks. And so we've got to make sure that we serve the Lord with gladness. And the key to that, again, is God Himself. We have an example in the New Testament. I'm sure some of you probably already thought of it. And uh, someone serving, but not with gladness. In Luke chapter 10, we read about Martha. Boy, she was busy, wasn't she? Was Martha, do- Martha doing a good thing? Yeah, nothing wrong with what Martha was doing. We read in beginning in verse 32, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. The Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, a guest 
at the home of Martha. And it says, and she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha, and, and there, there are some things we learn about Martha in uh, these next uh, verses that uh, we have from Christ. It says, but Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Can you imagine dictating to Christ what he should do? Bid her that she come help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, can't, can't you sense the care and concern from the Lord Jesus when he's speaking to Martha? Mentions her name not once, but twice. Martha, Martha. Thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. She was cumbered, we read. That means she was distracted. Cares the idea, that word uh, of being distracted. And, and Martha had allowed her service a good thing, cooking, preparing a meal for the Lord Jesus. But she had allowed that service to become a distraction from the Lord Himself. And I'm afraid we do the same thing sometimes, don't we? We get wrapped up in our service and, you know, we certainly ought to do a good job and do the best we can and, and put our all into it. And, uh, you know, uh, what, whatever our service and our responsibilities may be, we should be doing it heartily as unto the Lord. But do we ever allow our work and our labor to distract us from Christ Himself? She did. I think we know that from what uh, Jesus said in verse 42. He says, But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Here Martha was criticizing her sister for not helping her, and yet Jesus commends Mary for what she was doing. In Martha's mind, she wasn't doing anything. In Martha, uh, in her mind, Mary was a slacker, lazy, not, uh, not serving like she should. But Jesus said, uh, one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part. And so that tells us that while we're serving, hopefully with, with joy and gladness, it is absolutely necessary that we maintain fellowship with Christ. That we never allow our service to distract us from Him. It also says that uh, Martha was careful. That word carries the idea that she was anxious. Troubled, Jesus said. Troubled about many things. And uh, <coughs> uh, picture a pot of boiling water. That's what uh, the word means there, to make turbid. I mean, that water just boiling. <clears throat> and instead of serving with gladness, Martha had allowed what she was doing for Jesus to distract her from Him. And she, she had become anxious. And uh, I, I suppose that uh, the word that we would be uh, acquainted with probably more than anything would be, she was uptight. And, and uh, the more she worked, the, the tighter she got. Well, she was troubled, and evidently, based on what this says, she reached a boiling point with anger or uh, being discontent with what Mary was doing, and she expressed that resentment. And that 
prompted her to even confront Jesus and accuse him of not caring. Carest thou not? Who in their right mind would accuse Jesus of not caring? That's what uh, uh, being cumbered about much serving did for Martha. And so she's certainly not an example of serving with gladness. But I got to ask the question when we're thinking about that. <clears throat> Is that the way the Lord desires that we serve? Well, the answer to that is clear, isn't it? Absolutely not. We're to serve with gladness, with joy. And then... <clears throat> question to follow up that one is this is that the way I say if I am serving am I serving with gladness am I is my service characterized by just a, a, a bad attitude or just do it out of a sense of duty or drudgery but am I doing it with gladness. Now, there are all kinds of reasons biblically why we should do that. Serve Him with gladness. A couple of them right here in Psalm 100. Look, look if you would, uh, back at verse 2. Why should you, why should I serve the Lord with gladness? Well, you know, you could, uh, you could answer that with a general statement and say, well, because of what he's done for us. And that'd be true. But what specifically has he done for us and, and provided for us? Verse 2, it says, in the latter part of the verse, come before his presence with singing. Isn't it amazing really a testimony to the grace of God that He would even invite us into His presence. Come before His presence. I've never been invited into the presence of uh, any of the presidents of the United States. And there have been a few since I've been living. I never got a letter. Oh, I get... Uh, <clears throat> I guess I should uh, qualify that. There's not a day goes by that I don't get about 10 or 15 texts from one of the candidates now, and I'm not going to mention any names or anything. I mean, you'd think I was the best friend. And I don't know, I told Pat today, I was sitting there reading or doing something, and uh, you know, my phone buzzed, and I looked at it, and it was a text. But it was too pat on my phone. And I thought, now how in the world has that happened? So uh, <clears throat> I, I, I don't know whether I could consider that an invitation to uh, come into the presence of, you know, presidential candidate or not. But I, I've never been invited. You know what? That's fine. And even if I were invited and, and, and went, and uh, was in the presence of uh, the president, whoever it may be, or some king uh, somewhere else in the world, that would pale in comparison to what God has done for us. Come before His presence. That's an amazing invitation, isn't it? And, and by God... Himself, the one that we learn from verse 3 is our Creator. And we know from other scriptures that He's the sustainer. He has all power. And yet He says that we're to come before His presence. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, To the pray, talking about Christ, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted. In the beloved. Not only do we have that invitation to come into his presence, 
But we're guaranteed acceptance into His presence. How? Through Christ. Accepted in the Beloved. And that's the key. Again, going back to our position in Christ and what we have in Him. What He's done for us and provided by His grace for us. Come before His presence. Now you contrast that with uh, what our condition was prior to our salvation. I'm not going to take the time to read all of the verses, but in Ephesians 2, just listen to some of the words that uh, we find there that describe us before we got saved. Uh, We're aliens, strangers, without God in the world. We're far off. Speaking of far, being far off from God. Again, Uh, The second time, we're afar off. And of course, the point that he's making there in Ephesians 2 is that now we are reconciled to God by and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So why should we serve Him with gladness? Because of this great privilege that we have to come into His presence. And when we come knowing that we are accepted into His presence. And there's something else that has to be true in this matter of acceptance by Him. And that involves the necessity of the forgiveness of our sin. Just a couple of psalms over. Look at Psalm 103 and verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Now what are some of those benefits? The first thing that He mentions is this. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Forgiveness. Why should you serve? Why should I serve? Why should we do it with gladness? If nothing else. Because of the fact that He has forgiven us our sin. All of our sin. All of our iniquities. Ephesians 1, 7, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. One of the best examples of that, of forgiveness in action that I'm aware of is in Luke chapter 15 uh, of the prodigal son. He had his own way, didn't he? He wanted his own way and he got it. And it ended up costing him everything that he had. And when he finally came to himself, he, he made the decision that his father's servants had, had it better than him. And he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go back home and I'm going to be content just to be one of my father's servants. His father wouldn't let him do that. Was his father willing to forgive? Ready to forgive? Why? I mean, he, he was standing looking for the son to return. And before that son got the words, make me as one of your servants out of his mouth, the father said, uh, <clears throat> bring forth the kill the fatted calf, put a ring on his finger. I mean, he restored him and forgave him. And that's exactly what the Lord has done for us. So why should we serve with gladness? And I've got to stop. Uh, well, one, because we're accepted into His presence. Two, we are absolutely and totally forgiven of all of our sin. Let me just mention this and we'll close. Uh, Look at verse 3. Know you that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are His people 
and the sheep of his pasture. That's, that's the relationship that the child of God has with the Father. He's our shepherd. We are his sheep. And what does the shepherd do for the sheep? Well, he, he provides for them. He protects them. We see that in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, he says. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. That's the testimony of the sheep. My cup runneth over. You think he had a desire to serve the Lord and to serve him gladly? I think the answer is obvious to that. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why should we serve gladly? Well, because we've got a shepherd that watches over us, that cares for us, that provides and protects us uh, everything that uh, we need in, in our Christian lives. Our shepherd has provided. Now that ought to motivate us to serve, but not just serve. That ought to stir us to serve gladly. <clears throat> Do you deserve anything that God has done for you? The only thing that I deserve is hell. And that's it. I don't, I don't think I've uh, mentioned this to you, but uh, <clears throat> Brother Alverson, our first pastor here, he called me a few days ago, and uh, I said hello, and he said hello, and I said, how you doing? And he said, well, and you, 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 those of you that remember him know, know how his voice was. He said, well, I got up this morning, my feet hit the floor, and I wasn't in hell. And it's been getting better ever since. So I'd say he's having a pretty good day. The only thing we deserve is hell. And God has done all this for us, invited us into His presence, and absolutely promised us that in Christ we'll be accepted and forgiven us all of our sin and has taken upon Himself the responsibility of being our shepherd, guaranteeing our care. Shouldn't we say, Dear Lord, help me to serve You. Help me to serve You gladly. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank You for all that uh, you have given us in Christ. And Lord, there, there, uh, all of the benefits, all of the blessings that we have in Him are more than can be numbered. We hadn't even scratched the surface in thinking about what you've done for us. But I pray that uh, you would help each one of us as we do reflect upon our acceptance by you and the forgiveness that you provided for us, the fact that you watch over us and you care for us. Lord, as we remember those things, I pray that it would stir our hearts to the point that we will joyfully say, Lord, here's my life. It, it's not much, but what it is, I, I give it to you and my desire is to serve you faithfully and to serve you 
with gladness and joy. Lord, we pray that it would be so in all of our hearts because of what you've done for us and because of who you are. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray.